1969 to 77, eight years, two full terms. He followed that up with a trip around the world, 1877 to 79, and in 1880, there was an ill-fated effort to nominate Grant to a third term to the White House, but a deadlocked Republican National Convention, it had been deadlocked between Ulysses S. Grant and James Blaine, wound up settling on a dark horse compromise ticket of James Garfield for president and Chester Arthur for vice president. That marked the end of Ulysses S. Grant's public career, and this is Grant at age 60, approximately 1882. Following that last presidential convention, the last election of 1880, the Grants decided to settle in New York City. They settled in this brownstone on 3 East 66th Street. We have a couple of rare photos of the parlor of this lavish brownstone apartment. Uh, here's the library. Grant, during these New York City years, gave his name to a Wall Street investment firm known as Grant and Ward. The Grant in this name was Ulysses S. Grant Jr., his second son, but Ward was this man, Ferdinand Ward, who was a self-designated Napoleon of Wall Street, who uh, fancied himself a financial genius, uh, was known to make money, but some of the more sophisticated investors in the business community of the 1880s were a little suspicious of how he was able to make his money. But when he approached the elder Grant and mentioned that his son Ulysses Jr. had so much potential, would he give his name to this effort? Of course, uh, the former president uh, could not resist. The entire immediately, immediate family put their assets into Grant and Ward. And unfortunately, even though neither Grant had any idea, Ward, uh, back when Mr. Ponzi was still a toddler in Italy, he didn't really call them Ponzi schemes, but Ward was pulling the same sort of shenanigans, backing multiple loans with uh, the same collateral. And when these shenanigans came to fruition, it led to a panic, Grant and Ward collapsed, and the Grants found themselves several thousands of dollars in debt. This is in the spring of 1884. And it's at that point that Grant, who had done a little bit of writing, but never, never really occurred to him that he would write his own autobiography, was approached by Mark Twain, who had a real fascination with the former president. He said, and he, was his, he had his own publishing company, <coughs> that he thought if Grant were to write his autobiography, it could make a ton of money. And Grant, who had enjoyed writing some articles for Century Magazine the year before, 1883, agreed to do it, realizing that this was a way, uh, the only way that he could figure out to make his money back, pay off his debts, and bring his family back to a phase of financial security. But soon into this project, one day when Grant was biting into a peach, he noticed a sharp pain the back of his throat, and he waited uh, some time, because his doctor was vacationing in Europe at the time, uh, to have it checked out, but once it was, it was diagnosed as cancer of the throat. And this growth that was uh, detected there, the doctor said it would just be a matter of time before General Grant was no more. And so the last year of Grant's life is this dramatic story of his race against death to complete his memoirs uh, and to finally and very poignantly provide for his family. And the poignant thing about it was how much after all of the international fame he had achieved, he was at a stage in his life that resembled that of his pre-war years when it was for many years a struggle to provide for his family. And whoever would have thought in this at this time when there were no presidential pensions and he had spent most of his presidential savings on the world tour, that he would really need uh, all this sustenance after the collapse of Grant and Ward. Now the family tried to keep private his illness, but it was only a matter of time until someone leaked it out to the press. And what happened at that point was a veritable Grant death watch where you would have headlines uh, in the top papers. Here's a headline from uh, March 1st of 1885 when it 
uh, was disclosed, sinking into the grave. Uh, Grant's condition was reported as being dire. And he almost did die at that point, but he did make something of a recovery. A couple weeks later, you had another uh, headline like this. You could read the newspapers every day, and they would tell you what Grant's condition was. Here is just another, really a random headline from this period, uh, March 27th, New York Times uh, story, uh, noting that General Grant is taking a ride, he's receiving a visit from lawyers. He had another good day yesterday. And day after day, this death watch took place. Veterans and other admirers would file past his house on East 66th Street. But when they got to June, they realized as we're approaching the hot summer months, that Grant would be in better shape if they brought him to the cool mountain air of the Adirondacks. So the former president was moved to, to this cottage on Mount McGregor, just north of Saratoga, where he labored for the last six weeks of his life, writing his memoirs. He had to sleep at this point, sitting up. He subsisted largely from milk and cold soups. It was a miserable existence. When he swallowed, he said it felt like uh, swallowing molten lead. He often had to communicate by writing on slips of paper. But he was supported in this endeavor by his family. Here's a picture of Grant with all four of his children, uh, a couple of the wives of two of his uh, sons, and some grandchildren. Ulysses S. Grant, the third who I mentioned to you before, is the little boy at the very center at the bottom of that picture. And he's the one whose children and grandchildren uh, helped us out with the uh, restoration of the Grant Monument Association during the 1990s. This picture was the last ever taken of Grant. It was taken on July 19, 1885, and this was the approximate day that he finished his memoirs. He actually was able to win that race against death to get this manuscript done. And you notice, what is he doing in this photo? He's reading a newspaper. This is a man who realizes he's imminently going to be gone, and he's still taking an interest in the world's affairs. He has an attendant named Harrison Terrell, if you notice in the doorway just to the right, who also gets a cameo in this last picture of Grant. And it's on the morning of July 23rd, 1885, that in the room just uh, inside where that porch area was in the previous photo, Grant died at 8.08 a.m. This is what that room looked like. Uh, this is the picture was taken shortly after his death. And if you go up to the Grant Cottage State Historic Site, to this day you will see that this cottage remains in the exact same condition it was the moment of his death, complete with the mantelpiece, the furnishings, the clock that you see on the mantel was still stopped at 8.08, where his oldest son Frederick had stopped it stop the clock the moment of his death. You see here some floral arrangements from the 19th century. Well, amazingly, they were treated so that they still exist. I encourage all of you to pay a visit to Grant Cottage if you have not been there. It remains open as a New York State-run uh, historic site. Now, Grant's death uh, was seen as something that, among other things, would be a cause for national unity, for the enmity uh, that once caused the blue and the gray to fight to the death on the battlefield to put their differences aside. And one of the really gratifying things for Grant, as you see some of the iconography of the day, is that he saw this new harmony between the federal and the confederate. He wrote about it in the conclusion of his memoirs, very movingly. And at that time, you have to remember, even though it's very easy to forget that Grant was seen as belonging to the very highest echelon of great Americans uh, in our history. In the excerpt, for those of you who are at the replaying ceremony, I read some excerpts from Theodore Roosevelt's 1900 tribute to Grant, where he described Washington, Lincoln, and Grant, he called the first tier of great Americans. Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, he actually put on a second tier. Something very easy to forget, given what happened to Grant's reputation over the years, but something that we do see in, t in contemporary uh, late 19th century iconography is that these three Americans uh, were seen as occupying an equal place in the country's attention. And just as soon 
as Brandt breathed his last. It was, in fact, later that day that the question arose, well, where is his final resting place going to be? And Mayor William Grace of New York City was on top of this. Uh, after initially giving the Grant family a choice of New York parks, uh, Grant was a fan of Central Park, which is a brownstone was just a few steps away from. The family settled on this bluff in a very newly developed uh, park called Riverside Park. It was only founded in 1875, and if you see from this uh, photograph in 1879, the intersection of Riverside Drive and 122nd Street, just how undeveloped, just how run down it is. Well, Julia Grant, uh, the general's widow, was happy with this uh, spot. It occupied bluffs, uh, one of the highest, not the highest, but one of the highest points of elevation overlooking the Hudson River. And although Grant had uh, been interested in West Point as a possible burial site, he was under the impression that women couldn't be buried there. And when his son Fred asked him about, uh, about it, he mentioned New York City because of the kindness of New Yorkers to him in his time of need, or St. Louis or Illinois, previous residences of places that he would like to be considered. But the family very quickly decided on New York, and in a matter of days, preparations were underway for his funeral. A steel company, upstate New York, uh, developed this uh, steel coffin with a glass uh, lid to it, where the body, this is not a picture with the actual body, none of those exist that we're aware of, but this is the uh, coffin that was developed for Grant's uh, remains. Those were to be contained in this case that you see here from the Franklin Ironworks. Here was an etching that was made at the time. Uh, Grant was so emaciated from cancer that he was, his finger was too uh, emaciated for his wedding ring. And there you see his son, Fred, very touchingly putting the wedding ring on his father's uh, finger. And here we see the train, the funeral train, making its way south from Mount McGregor en route to New York City. But before it reached New York City, it would make a stop in Albany. And here you see a procession that took place on August 4th, 1885. 85,000 people filed past Grant's casket in the New York State Capitol, which you can see in the background there. About 6,000 people per hour would come to view the casket, and this outpouring of public grief was nothing compared to what actually came on the day of Grant's funeral, which was August 8th of 1885. For that event, buildings all over New York City were adorned in funereal, um, in mourning bunting. You see a bunch of pictures here, all from uh, New York, uh, plus a photo right here. But travel being what it was, and this is also an expression of a reflection of just how popular Grant was during this time. In other locations, there were other sort of mini funerals, mourning ceremonies that were staged, complete with the mourning bunting and businesses being closed down so that here, for example, you'll see uh, what Chicago looked like on the day of Grant's funeral, which was to be a national day of mourning. Here's the state capitol in Des Moines, Iowa, the nation born, if you see that sign on the pediment just above the entrance. But in New York City, where the funeral was to take place, this is what City Hall looked like. And that is where, initially, the people of New York filed past Grant's casket. And following that came this funeral procession, which began at City Hall. Uh, I can show you, in addition to this close-up of the <coughs> Uh, cab file that, that Grant had. Here are some badges and mourning ribbons, just some examples uh, of three of the many different varieties uh, of mementos that you would see on Grant's uh, funeral day. From City Hall, the procession went up Broadway, made its way uh, Fifth Avenue, 50, turned at 57th Street, eventually made its way up Riverside Drive, Grant's funeral contained about 60,000 marchers. The parade itself stretched seven miles. It took five hours for the parade to pass a, a single point, 
And you see this in this picture, is how, what a throng of people were there to watch this funeral procession. One moving feature of this all was the pallbearers. Grant's pallbearers included not only his former comrades, Generals William Sherman and Phil Sheridan and Admiral David Porter, who fought for the Union side, but it also included two former Confederate generals, Simon Bolivar Buckner and Joseph Johnston. Uh, here you can see some of the pallbearers making their way during the ceremony. The grand marshal of the funeral procession was Winfield Scott Hancock, regarded as one of the greatest Union generals who never enjoyed his own independent command, but also someone who had some political differences with Grant after the war, because Hancock became a Democrat, and Grant and most of uh, his colleagues were Republicans. But this was symbolic that old political differences no longer meant anything at this moment of national unity. Uh, in this picture, it'll look really tiny. Uh, Hancock and his uh, uh, comrades are making their way to the funeral uh, procession. There was also a naval tribute that took place. These uh, several ships made their way up the Hudson River. And of course, all of this was headed for this destination, for Riverside Park. And here you see the funeral uh, uh, attendees, the, the, the spectators who are waiting for the casket to make its way to Grant's temporary tomb, which I'll turn to in just one moment. Here you see the coffin making its way into Riverside Park. Here you see the throng around his temporary tomb. It was difficult even for, for photographers at the moment to get uh, a good perspective on it. But here, picture taken uh, shortly afterwards, is the temporary tomb. It was constructed within the two-week period following Grant's death so that it was ready uh, by his April 8th funeral. Here's a rare image of the interior of the tomb, but after his death, this is what the interior actually looked like, which was packed with <coughs> floral arrangements. And all, as all of this was happening, something else that started the moment of Grant's death was the pooling together of resources to construct a fitting final resting place for Ulysses S. Grant. And that's where the Grant Monument Association comes in. They were incorporated by a special act of the New York State Legislature to raise the money and administer Grant's final resting place. The first president of the Grant Monument Association was the former U.S. President Chester Arthur. The first secretary of this organization was Richard Greener, the first African-American graduate of Harvard and a political supporter of Grant's. Uh, here's the Grant Monument Association headquarters on Broadway in the funeral uh, bunting on the day of his funeral. And in the early years of Grant's tomb, and remember Grant's tomb at that point is this small temporary tomb structure, you would continue to see throngs come to pay their respects and to memorialize the departed chieftain. What you see here, this throng is not from Grant's funeral. And although Grant's funeral itself was accompanied by about 1.5 million spectators, which by the way made it the most widely attended event in any one time and location in the history of the North American continent up to that time. Well, in subsequent months and years, you would have other throngs of people who would gather for Memorial Day exercises or to commemorate Grant's birthday. This was the first Memorial Day uh, that followed the dedication of Grant's tomb, and this is how the grave was decorated for Memorial Day. Well, the Grant Monument Association organized two architectural competitions to come up with a winning design for Grant's final tomb. They had to do two because the first one did not produce any designs that the Grant Monument Association board was happy with. First place in that first competition, which took place between 1888 and 1889, was this uh, design that was submitted by Paul Schultze. Uh, second prize went to this design. J. Philip Roth was the designer here. But while most of, most of these submissions were in the obelisk category, or not too far a departure from an obelisk, which was more reflective of 
American monuments up to that point, the GMA's board thought that there should be a more capacious, wider, more voluminous and majestic uh, final resting place. So they decided to hold a second competition that would be confined to five of the most widely recognized and well-regarded architects who were operating at that point. I'll show you one of those designs. This is one that was submitted by John Carrere and Thomas Hastings for that second 1890 architectural competition. Of course, this was not the winning design, as you know, just from being across the street. The winning design was the one submitted by this man, John Hemingway Duncan, who previously had been most famous for the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial in Brooklyn, just by Prospect Park. If you go there, actually you walk uh, in, in under that arch, you will see this relief equestrian uh, depiction of Ulysses S. Grant. This is the, the design that Duncan came up with for Grant's final resting place. You see it looks a little bit different from what we have today. There's a little bit more statuary. There's a finial at the very top. There are several equestrian statues, one on the steps and then four of them above the pillars. But you do see a neoclassical structure with Doric columns up front, with a cupola uh, on the top that was more reflective of European uh, monuments of this type. Uh, you see here a cross section of Duncan's earlier design. His initial conception was to have a grand approach to the Hudson River, which had a railway closer to the water uh, that looked something like what you see in this picture. But while Duncan estimated this to cost about $54,000, that was the estimate that he came up with, the New York City commissioners of parks said, no, there's no way this could be done for that little. This is going to cost something like $250,000. And so that never quite happened. But the architectural influences for Duncan's design included the tomb of Mausolus at Halicarnassus in modern-day Turkey, which was the original mausoleum. It used to be one of the seven wonders of the world. We, we don't know exactly what it looks like, but this is one depiction uh, in the one of the many drawings we have of what it may have looked like. So this is a digitized version. Hadrian's tomb in Rome was another influence. This is what Hadrian's tomb looked like in antiquity uh, before uh, it uh, was given some of its brown uh, permanent walls that are still there to this day. Napoleon's tomb at Les Invalides in Paris, you see the sarcophagus on the marble floor and a circular crypt would be the most stark, vivid influence on the interior of Grant's tomb. And then the most recent influence by far was the Garfield Memorial, Lakeview Cemetery in Cleveland, Ohio. This is where President James Garfield was buried after he was cut down by an assassin's bullet in 1881 at the age of 49. So these were architectural influences that were very much considered by John Duncan. But just as construction, as fundraising was underway, because construction doesn't begin quite yet when we hit 1890, there was this ongoing debate over whether Grant should be buried in New York City. And it was not for any lack of regard of Grant in New York, but it was in fact because there was so much uh, competition. There were so many people who thought that this national figure should not be buried in a city like New York, that it should go to a more national uh, destination like Washington, D.C., or nearby Arlington National Cemetery. And the fundraising really hit an obstacle in the form of a certain amount of resentment uh, toward New York that existed even back then, not thinking that this place should house Grant's final resting place. Also competing with the fundraising for the tomb, were other grant monument projects, other grant monument committees that came up to fund other monuments to grant in cities all over the country. So there was a grant monument committee to fund this uh, memorial, this statue in St. Louis. Uh, you have this statue at Fort Leavenworth. You have another in Galena, Illinois, Grant's hometown. You have this wonderful equestrian statue 
in Chicago's Lincoln Park. If you go to Chicago, you'll find a statue of Grant in Lincoln Park, and you'll find a statue of Lincoln in Grant Park. <laughs> San Francisco had its own Grant monument. And there's yet another wonderful equestrian statue in Philadelphia. This is a rare photo of its unveiling in 1899. And there was even a Grant Equestrian that the GMA did not think, they really didn't want it in front of uh, the tomb here because they weren't crazy about its design, but it did make its way to Brooklyn, Bedford-Stuyvesant, where it was dedicated in 1896, one year before uh, the monument itself would be. Well, there was a lot of lobbying going on behind the scenes. There were resolutions introduced in Congress. One uh, proposed this military museum slash mausoleum where national heroes, including Grant, would be buried, although uh, the sponsor of this resolution didn't propose exactly what departed heroes would have their remains moved there. There was another resolution saying Grant should be buried in Arlington Cemetery. Julia Grant exerted her influence to not to make sure these resolutions didn't go anywhere. And thanks to the work of the New York uh, state delegation in Congress, the resolutions didn't go anywhere, and it could be reported by December of 1890 <coughs> that yeah, Grant's remains are going to rest at Riverside Park. Uh, but there was still a lot of difficulty in getting the funds raised because although the Grant Monument Association included some really illustrious figures, uh, I mentioned to you Chester Arthur and Richard Greener. You also had people like Rutherford B. Hayes and Theodore Roosevelt who were involved. But they really, you had a lot of busy people who had their attention divided. They didn't have the top fundraising prowess. And all of that would change when this man, Horace Porter, came in as the fifth president of the Grant Monument Association in 1892. Now, Porter had been an aide-de-camp to Grant during the Civil War and a presidential secretary during his White House years. Uh, it's a wonderful book, Campaigning with Grant, which is one of the best primary sources on Grant for those of you who are not familiar with it. Well, Porter and a man by the name of Edward F. Cragen, who was a Chicago man who was responsible for organizing a successful campaign to bring the 1893 World's Fair to Chicago, they orchestrated a grand fundraising strategy that would pull off an amazing feat of raising the funds that were necessary for this monument without any public money. Not by the way that they didn't approach uh, Congress or the New York State Legislature for funds, but they wound up not securing any, so all of the money that would be donated to build the tomb came from private funds. Now with Cragen's help and, and Porter's initiative, they established 185 fundraising committees. Some 2,500 people would occupy these fundraising committees, which covered people in all different walks of life. You had Grant Monument fundraising committees uh, organized among bank uh, book publishers, artists, decorators. There was a restaurant committee that was headed up by Charles Delmonico. There was a piano manufacturer's committee headed up by William Steinway. Uh, there was a jeweler's committee headed up by Charles Tiffany. And the list goes on. Here is a subscription, a sample of a subscription page from an African-American newspaper called The Freeman. And you can see several members of its staff making pledges of money to be donated to Grant's tomb. Collection boxes like this were seen in every bank, hotel, elevated train station, stores, and even steamboats throughout New York City, where they would collect in however small an amount, whatever contribution they could. And ultimately, ultimately, the fundraising was spectacularly successful. Horace Porter was able to raise $350,000, which is more than 50% of what it cost to build Grant's tomb in a period of about 90 days in 1892. The monument wound up costing a total of over $600,000 donated by 90,000 donors, an estimated 90,000, a good majority of whom were New Yorkers. The success of that effort led to this uh, Harper's uh, 
cartoon, better late than never. They could see finally the monument is going to be constructed. Now, ground was broken for Grant's tomb in 1891 on Grant's birthday that year, and there's a certain irony in how much this location looked like battlefield fortifications as they were doing the digging for Grant's tomb. Here's a picture of the actual ceremony that, take pl that took place with an oration uh, by uh, Porter. And here you see, uh, at the, about the time of the groundbreaking, a cartoon that was run showing you once again how the blue and grays reconciliation was embodied in this new monumental undertaking. And it was the next year, on Grant's birthday, April 27, 1892, that President Benjamin Harrison laid the cornerstone of the monument. This would have been Grant's 70th birthday. He was only 63 when he died. Over the next five years, while Riverside Park and Riverside Drive saw same leisure activities, cycling, the carriaging that had defined that area, this, this burgeoning young uh, uh, city park, well, Grant's tomb was being constructed in several stages. By 1896, it essentially was uh, completed. I'll tell you a little bit, just for a moment, about the features of the monument. The exterior is made of granite, about 8,000 tons of granite. The interior is made of Lee and Carrera marble from Massachusetts and Italy. J. Massey Rhymes, a Scottish-born relief sculptor, depicted over here, sculpted the allegorical figures that support Grant's epitaph, let us have peace. You have an allegorical representation of peace on the left and victory holding the sword on the right. Let us have peace was the closing sentence in Grant's letter of acceptance to the Republican National Convention of 1868 when he accepted his nomination to the presidency. Here's a photograph of the interior of the tomb where you can see the marble in stark relief. If you look up toward the dome, you'll, you might notice there are several other J. Massey Rhine sculptures that are there. If you look in each of the pendentives, as they are called, these triangular portions, you start at the lower right-hand corner, you go counterclockwise, you have depictions of Grant's birth, his military life, his civilian life, and his death. Grant's sarcophagus would weigh eight tons and would be made of red granite from Wisconsin. It's treated to look like marble, but it is actually granite. It rests on an Ohio granite platform. And if you look at this picture, early 1897, before the dedication of Grant's tomb, you can see the temporary tomb behind the permanent tomb. Now the temporary tomb would be taken down before the funeral, and in its place would be put a Chinese memorial at the direction of the man that you see on the right, the Chinese Viceroy Li Hung Chang. When Grant made his trip around the world in 1879, he and Li really hit it off, and Li Hung Chang lived until the early, at the very beginning of the 20th century, and had such an affection for Ulysses S. Grant, he's so moved by his, his death that he wanted to do something to commemorate him, here you see a frame of a very rare motion picture, which might not even exist anymore, but we do have this picture of Li Hung Chang visiting Grant's temporary tomb in 1896. Well, a month after the permanent tomb was dedicated, Li Hung Chang's emissary, a man named Yang Yu, planted uh, a tree, uh, and, and soon after that a, a witness tree, I should say with it, a witness tree of a ginkgo tree and a Chinese cork or, or philodendron tree to stand as a witness to the other tree with a plaque that was put up by the New York City Parks Department a few months later so that people could identify the significance of this Chinese memorial. So you can find the language there in both English and Chinese. Eventually they had to put a fence around it because visitors were hacking pieces of the tree away and it probably would have died by 19, they, they probably would have died by 1920 had they done nothing to protect them. There was also, right where we are right now, what they called a women's comfort station, but this was woefully insufficient to handle 
uh, the restroom needs of the many visitors who came to Grant's tomb. Uh, you had over 600,000 people uh, of, you know, at, at their peak year during the 1900s who would visit the monument. By 1910, this overlook structure was built, and we are just downstairs uh, in what used to be public restrooms and have since been made into this small visitor center facility that you see. But this is the monument as it appeared uh, at its completion approximately during its first year. Now, 10 days before the dedication of Grant's tomb, his coffin was supposed to be quietly taken up the stairs to be put into the tomb, uh, but it turned out that thousands of people who had heard about this <coughs> showed up to see this scene. But for the actual dedication day, you see a couple of relics from Grant's uh, tomb's dedication day, you would have another outpouring of affection for Grant and remembrance to <coughs> rival his funeral of 12 years earlier. And you know, think about how much a person will receive from, from memory, especially public figures, a dozen years after they've died. Well, that didn't happen in this case. Grant's day, the day of the dedication of Grant's tomb, was made a full public holiday in New York. You had an amazing turnout of, uh, of people to correspond to uh, the people who had been there 12 years earlier. Now, most of Grant's comrades who had been pallbearers back in 1885 were themselves departed at this point, so former Union General Grenville Dodge was the Grand Marshal of the parade for the dedication of Grant's tomb. Uh, Dodge's contingent is in this picture right here. Once again, you had another parade which made its way from Madison Square Park all the way up here. About 55,000 marchers. So just about 5,000 or so fewer than had marched in his funeral parade. You could see them coming through an archway that was specially constructed for the dedication. In the reviewing stand stood President William McKinley and former President Grover Cleveland. There was another naval tribute uh, up the Hudson River. You'll see this picture just in the next room. <coughs> another view that you have there. This is what the scene looked like from across the river by the uh, Palisades. But if you came closer to the action, uh, it was a real, the, the number of bleachers that were set up for people to witness the dedication of Grant's was tremendous. And it is estimated that one million people were there to attend to be spectators at the dedication of Grant's tomb. There's a few other rare photos during the dedication exercises. This is Bishop John Newman, uh, who gave the uh, opening prayer at that ceremony. Horace Porter here very deservedly gave the oration talking about U.S. Grant's legacy. It was really the keynote speech, although the most prominent speech, although much shorter than Porter's, was that of President William McKinley. And then sitting in the foreground uh, to the left, you have Mayor William Strong, who also took a turn to deliver his remarks. And in the audience, you had Julia Grant, who's seated there second from the right, flanked by their son Fred and Fred's wife Ida. And then to Ida's left, you have Fred and Ida's two children. There's Julia Grant, the future Princess Cantacuzene, who married a Russian prince, and then after the Bolshevik uprising, made her way back to the US and became a fixture in Washington social life until her death at the age of 99 in 1975. Mm -hmm. And then to her left is US Grant III. So Julia Grant was there to see the construction of her final, and the, the dedication of her final resting place. And she would enjoy visits to the monument. Uh, she would actually take carriage trips on some occasions with Verena Howell Davis, the widow of the Confederate President Jefferson Davis, to see the progress that was taking place on Grant's tomb. And five years after the dedication, Julia herself died, on December 14, 1902. And this is what the crypt of Grant's tomb looked like right after her funeral. 
they decided, in addition to all of the flowers that you see decorating Julia's grave, on Ulysses' sarcophagus, you see a single vase of white roses that they put there, because that's what Julia would leave when she would come to visit her husband's final resting place. And when she died, the New York Times obituary had, as a subheading, a wealthy woman. In the intervening 17 years since Brandt's death, the memoirs became a fantastic, a record-breaking hit. They sold so many copies that the Grant family made approximately $450,000 in royalties, which if you converted it to modern dollars, you're in tens and tens of millions of dollars. Not only was this money enough <coughs> to pay off the Grant family's debt, but it was enough to give them a level of financial security that marked a really happy ending to the general, the story of the general's final struggle, his race against death, which he wound up winning, and which you can now come and remember and commemorate as we did today at his final resting place, which remains the largest, in terms of volume, the largest mausoleum in the Western Hemisphere. So with that, I uh, thank you all for coming, and if, if there are any questions, uh, thank you.